are going to briefly look at the parable of the wheat and the weeds found in Matthew chapter 13. So we're going to ask that you open your Bibles up to that, Matthew chapter 13. If you, I mean, if you have your Bibles with you, hold them up and repeat after me. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The book of all ages. I will know it. I will believe it. I will live it. Amen. Matthew chapter 13. Starting with verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Well, uh, like an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It never ceases to amaze me how the evil one can come into a good city. How he can find a good church where there's good Christians and Satan will place in the church a chaotic member to try and mess things up. The enemy in this parable crept into the field with the mindset to destroy. He crept in with the mindset to destroy the crop. This brings to mind Philippians chapter 3. A portion of today's sermon I preached about 30 years ago. That tells you how old I am. Some of you were probably uh, still very young. Many of you are much older than me. But the sermon I preached about 30 years ago, it was based on a sermon a preacher delivered by the name of B.W. Smith Jr. years before me based out of Buffalo, New York. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. This will be our primary focus of our text today. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evil doers, those mutilators of the flesh. Watch those dogs. Watch those dogs. Paul, the speaker and writer of our text, warns the Christians of the Philippian church to beware of the false teachers and false prophets who are always barking like a dog against the principles of of the gospel that they were founded upon. Paul called them evil workers because they were growling with the dog spirit instead of shouting with the Holy Spirit. Some of these false teachers and false prophets were Jews who were trying to hold on to the practices of Judaism by circumcision instead of regeneration. Paul here in Philippians warns the true Christian to beware of these church fighters who are uh, uh, going around like a dog, barking at their good works. Uh, he warns them to beware. That is, watch those dogs. These false teachers whom the Apostle Paul warns the Philippian Christians against were men of evil spirit rather than men of good spirit. That is men with a dog spirit rather than 
the Holy Spirit. We read in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 10 and 11. He called the crooks in the church greedy dogs and dumb dogs. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. Well, I, I might like the King James Version uh, just a little bit better where it says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. But in our text, Paul characterizes these hypocrites in the church as dogs. He characterizes them as evildoers and mutilators of the flesh. He warned the Philippian church not to heed their barking, but to watch those dogs. But in the scripture, God uses the habits and disposition. I look at the habits and disposition of the animal kingdom and other creeping things to compare with the habits and the disposition of human beings in the social order. If you were to look in the book of Acts, chapter 11 and verse number 6, Peter had a vision, and he saw all nations represented by four-footed beasts, creeping things and fowls of the air. Some people on earth have habits like the lower creatures in disposition. Jesus himself, according to the scripture, was lamb-like in, in um, humility, lion-like in power, brazen serpent-like in saving power. Some people in our churches are cunning and sly like a fox. Jesus compared Herod to a fox in Luke chapter 13 and verse number 32. He told the Pharisees, go tell that fox. Some people are deceitful like a snake. John the Baptist saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, and he said in Matthew, the third chapter, and the seventh verse, you brood of vipers, that snake-like, isn't it, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Paul, I mean our text, calls these hypocrites in the church dogs. Some people in church have habits like an alley dog. Always has his head in a garbage can. Always tracking down filth and dirt. Some people in church are in the alley in their thinking and gossiping. They glory in the bad things and they fight all the good things. Y'all don't have to say amen. I can say amen myself. Don't bother them. Just watch those dogs. The Jews, according to the 15th chapter of Matthew in the 27th verse, regarded the Gentiles as dogs because the Gentiles ate all manner of meat. But, I mean, our text, Paul turns the table and he calls the, the Jews dogs because they lived on the laws of Judaism. But, they, they praised the, the Christians that fed on a higher spiritual food. Now, it has always been dangerous to call a man a dog. It's just dangerous to call a man a dog. Unless you call him a big dog. Now, he doesn't mind you calling him a big dog. But don't call a man a dog. Now, in each case we find where man is called dog in the Bible, it's because of their spiritual uncleanliness. So let's go into the dog likeness of some people. The first kind of dog we have is the town dog. This is a city dog. He was born in the city. He has no pedigree. He is, no, I mean, he is of no particular grief. He has no family tree to speak of. He's a sooner. He would sooner do this or that as to do that or this. I know a man from my hometown of Indiana that had a dog like this once. And this dog was so lazy that he would seldom go around the house. He would just sit under the back doorstep. He was so lazy, he wouldn't even scratch fleas. 
If you threw him a biscuit, uh, uh, he would uh, uh, just sit there if it didn't get close enough to him, and he wouldn't reach out to grab it. He would just lay there and go hungry. But there was one thing this dog could do. At night, he would lay under the, the step, and he would bark at the moon, and in 15 minutes, he would have every dog in town barking. This is true of some people in our church. They can start something and get everybody in church stirred up. They are no good to the church. They are no good to the community. They are no good to the eldership. But they can start more trouble in church, and it will take an army to quiet them down. They gossip about what they know and what they don't know. Don't you bother those dogs. You're just watching. The second kind of dog is a mad dog. A mad dog is crazy. And he will cause every dog that comes that he comes in contact with just to go crazy. They foam at the mouth. And you have to stay away from them because their madness is contagious. And because they're mad, they want everybody else in church to be mad too. They throw off their poison and their lies to anybody that will listen. You better watch those mad dogs. They are a danger to have in your church. Then we have some bird dogs I'm in our churches. This is our third type of dog. The bird dog comes in two different classes. He comes, I'm in a pointer and a set. The pointer doesn't kill the birds. He just points them out, and he has somebody else to do the killing. Now, when the man goes out hunting, the pointer will find the birds, and he'll point them out. And when the hunter gets there, the bird dog will jump into the bushes and make the birds fly, and the hunter will kill the birds. You see, Judas was a pointer. He didn't kill Jesus. He just pointed them out. He said, the one that I kiss is the one that you sees. The other kind of dog, the other class of dog is the seven. Everything you bring to them as it relates to church, they just want to sit on. You're not going to get the program off the ground because those bird dogs are always sitting on it. Let me go back home and let me think about this for a minute, a moment. I'll get back to you. And, and they never really get back to you because they're sitting on it. Let me go home and think about it. But let me study this for a while. But then they never act. That's a sin. That's just going to sit there and going to kill the program. Watch those dogs. The fourth dog is the feist dog. I don't know how many of you have a little feist dog running around, but he is a small, little, bitty, tiny little dog that makes a lot of noise. Just keeps up noise all the time. Yak, 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 yak. Listen to this story that I heard about a feist dog. A man had a feist dog that lived by a man that had a big Doberman pincher. And every morning, this man would walk his Doberman, his big Doberman, down the sidewalk, past where this little vice was. And when he passed by the little vice, the little vice would jump off the porch, run down the walkway, and hit up against the gate, knowing that the gate was locked. And he would follow the Doberman all the way down the fence, just yak, 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 all the way down the fence. And this big Doberman would never looked around. He wouldn't pay him any attention. He just kept on stepping. And every morning as the Doberman went by, the little feist would come tearing off the porch. And this would be his usual procedure. But one morning, as it would happen, his owner forgot to latch the gate. And as he would uh, go out to the porch and uh, I mean, he didn't recognize that his owner did not latch the gate. And when the man with the Doberman came down the sidewalk, the little fox tore off the porch, as he would normally do. 
on a day-to-day -day basis. He ran down the walkway, he hit the gate, and the gate swung wide open. He stopped and looked up, and he was looking right in the face of the big dog. This big doberman said to himself, I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> I've been waiting for this opportunity. And he began to turn this little feist every which way but loose. Gave him a fairly good whooping. When he finally let him go, this, this a little fellow was so happy. I mean, the story goes that he goes back upon the porch slowly. He wipes his brow and he says, who in the world left the gate open? Who left it open? That's the way it is with some of our churches. Some of folks will raise $100 worth of trouble about a thing as long as the gate is locked. But when he has to face the issue, the first thing he'll say is that I don't know a thing about it. As far as I know, brother and sister so-and-so, they're okay with me. I don't know a thing about it. Because the gate is locked now. The gate is unlocked now, so I don't know a thing about it. But don't worry about these spice dogs. Just watch those dogs. The fifth type of dog is a chow dog. Chow dog. He has a black tongue, and he's a very treacherous type of dog. Chow dog is playful when he's a puppy. But when he gets old, he gets treacherous. Let me tell you, the church has suffered fights, fallen outs, and splits because of some treacherous people. Those people are nice until they get into a position of power. Treachery is the greatest enemy that the church has ever had. Treachery is, is the worst vice in human nature. Treachery is compounded of evil fraud, cowards, and revenge. Treachery destroys the principle of mutual confidence and security. Treachery is a cancer in our society. It will eat away love and peace. Treachery is the greatest traitor that committed domestic treason. Treachery will stop people from showing up on Wednesday nights. Treachery will stop the ladies from serving and coming together in fellowship. Treachery will stop the men's breakfast from coming together before it even starts. Treachery will stop all this, and treachery will, will stop a church from shouting, Amen. Treachery is a little dog in the middle of big dogs. You better watch them dogs. Well, then, we have another kind of dog. I mean, this is our final dog. It's the sixth dog. The final type of dog is a bloodhound. A bloodhound. This dog is used to track down criminals. Yes, we have some bloodhounds in our churches. People who have the instinct of a bloodhound for uncovering scandals in other folks' lives. They find out who's got the latest and juicy news on who. They will search your garbage can and see if they can find any liquor bottles or beer cans. Amen. And if you ask them about something that's going on and they don't know, they will tell you, well, I don't know right now, but you give me a couple of days, I'll get right back with you. I'll find out. I'll let you know. You watch those hound dogs. Now, these dogs are just a sampling of what could be considered weeds. I mean, our churches. What can be considered weeds within this particular parable? Now, I'm as we close, turn back over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to start in verse number 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He 
He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the evil um, um, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the harvesters are angels. Verse number 40. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Verse 42. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let's go back up to verse number 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. Church, we all are born pure and innocent. That's how we're born, pure and innocent. But sometimes, as we grow, many times as we grow, we develop bad habits. We develop a bad habit of being quick to anger rather than quick to listen. We develop a bad habit of getting into people's business when we should not be and then talking about it later on unless they've given you that permission to. Sometimes we develop bad habits of tradition. Not that all tradition is bad, but if tradition gets in the way of welcoming people into the body of Christ, that's a bad tradition. If you have a tradition that you're holding on to and it's not based biblically, that's a bad tradition if it's getting in the way of bringing somebody into the body of Christ. Some of us have developed bad habits, such as lying and stealing and cheating. Some of us have developed bad habits of, of uh, backbiting, backsliding, gossiping, being a manipulator. And, some, and then all those things are weeds that are brought into the body of Christ. And then tearing away at God's work. But you know what God can do? God can take that weed, he can take that weakness and turn it into a strength. Amen. He can do that if you allow him to work in your life. He can take that weed and make it glory, glorified in his name. He can take a bad thing and turn it into something good. Do you realize that? Do you believe that? Believe it from your nose to your toes because he can do it. Look at the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then a few chapters later in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23. For we all have sinned. But God has provided a way through his son, Jesus Christ. If we go back and look in the Old Testament, I'm probably of uh, chapter 17 and verse number 11 of the book of, of uh, I can't even say it, Leviticus. Go back there, look at that. There had to be a blood sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11. A blood sacrifice for atonement for one's life. There had to be. And then God sent his son, Jesus Christ. 
The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's great news. That's great news for you and for me. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. For I am not ashamed, because now I've been born again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone that believes. Everyone. No matter what your background is, no matter what you've been through in life, God loves you, and he's calling for each and every one of us. If you want to accept his invitation this morning, when we stand here in just a moment and sing this song, you can calm down. Don't be fearful. Don't be fearful. That's just a weed telling you not to. Don't be fearful. Give me your hand and give God your heart. Why don't you come as we together stand and sing this song?